my faith journey may be much like yours. That when I was growing up, there were women all around the faith community where I was as a boy. There was Clara and she directed the choir and there was Esther and she played the organ and the piano. But there was something very interesting. They never were up front leading worship. On Austin Faith Dialogue, we're going to talk about women in ministry and in leadership position. You'll want to stay with us on Austin Faith Dialogue. Austin Faith Dialogue, at the crossroads of religion and life. A series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. Welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm Carl Gronberg, host of the program, and thank you so much for being with us because I think you're going to find that our conversation on this program will interest you as we talk about some of the exciting things that are happening within the Christian faith family. I'd like you to meet two people who are with me, Kim Baker, who's a, an Episcopal seminarian, and Shelley Kronbergs, who's a Lutheran seminarian. Yes. Shelley, Kim, welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. Thank you. I had the opportunity to meet you, Kim, just before the program began, and you were talking a little bit about your growing up. You mm -hmm. grew up in Detroit, Michigan, mm -hmm. and what was interesting to me is that you were not part of a faith community as a child. Tell us a little bit about that. Why was that? Well, um, my parents actually had a fair amount of suspicion about organized religion. Mm -hmm. um, my father believed that it was very important to think independently, and that's really the way he, he raised my sister and me. And um, when he looked at the history of organized religion, uh, not just in this country, but really around the world, he was concerned about what he saw, and mm -hmm. he didn't discourage us from going to church. It's just that it, it wasn't a part of his um, belief system, so he also didn't take us to church, and um, I think my mother kind of acquiesced to it. Mm -hmm. And agreed with kind of that mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Is your father still living? No, no, he died several years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd be very proud of you because <laughs> he raised a daughter, from what I've experienced, <laughs> who does think for herself. And, yeah. and oh, I like to think that I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. You then went to high school, right. a Roman Catholic high school, right? and something happened to you there. Right. Well, um, the first week that I was at high school, I attended Mass, and it was just an incredibly powerful experience, mm -hmm. and it opened several new worlds that I had never been exposed mm -hmm. to. Um, and so all the way through high school, I continued going to Mass, and I eventually converted to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the reason was that the Order of Nuns that ran my high school was just a fabulous group of women. They um, were really kind of at the forefront of the post-Vatican II movement, and they were going to law school, and they were out marching in marches, and they really worked to encourage all of the, it was an all-girls school, mm -hmm. to encourage all of the girls uh, to understand that we were capable of doing anything we wanted mm -hmm. and that we had a responsibility to the world and to the church and that, that we should be prepared to take leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Make some choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was there in the high school that you experienced not only the liturgy and the mass, mm -hmm. but also the challenge to mm -hmm. think as your father was saying okay. to you as a person. Mm -hmm. And it was encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, again, this was uh, post-Vatican II, but still in the early days. Um, I think the, when people weren't really sure what direction the, the Roman Catholic Church was going, but it really looked at that point like things were going to open up and that eventually um, women would be ordained, there'd be married clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it seemed appropriate, I think, at that time to encourage the young women in my school to to be prepared to, to step in and fill. Pretty the exciting time yeah, in the life of the really church. It really was. And exciting yeah. for you as a person and Absolutely. as a believer. Were you then baptized? Yes, as baptized a, as and confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Shelley, how about you? You grew up uh, where? I grew up um, around Texas uh, in the Southern Baptist tradition. Mm -hmm. My uh, mother took us to Sunday school and to church very faithfully. Mm -hmm. And I grew up there. And when I got older, I was in high school, I um, had some questions that, that didn't seem to be answered, and I 
felt drawn to another direction. I looked around and, and didn't really find what I was looking for. When I got to college, I went to a Roman Catholic Mass, just like <laughs> you were talking about, and I was completely awestruck by the liturgy. I had never seen a liturgy before, and I felt connected to back through the ages, mm -hmm. to the church, to the roots mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. And I sensed that that was something very important. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't join the Roman Catholic Church, though. Um, I met someone who was Lutheran and went to church with him. Mm -hmm. And we, we eventually married, and I became a Lutheran. But at that point in your life, you didn't think about becoming a clergy within any no. faith tradition? No. At that point of your life, I'd seen that before. That wasn't it. Wasn't something that I even considered because I'd never seen it. Uh huh. I think that's an interesting point, Kim. Mm -hmm. That Shelley had never seen yeah. that. Had never seen a woman. Yeah. And as I was saying at the top of the program, for me as a boy, growing up in the faith tradition, and for me, church was just a given. That was a part of my family experience. As Swedish Lutherans, we went to worship on Sunday. But indeed, the Esthers and the Claras and all of those type of wonderful women of faith were, were serving God and the church Absolutely. in roles other than being up front. Right. They were never in terms of pastor. No. Where did the idea ever come for you, Kim, that, that you might be called mm. to become a clergy? Well, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I eventually left the Roman Catholic Church and when I left, I left saying that I just couldn't in faith belong to a church that said that as a woman I was less than equal. And I felt that, that the best expression of that was the fact that women couldn't be ordained. Um, at the time I had absolutely no thought that I w should be ordained, but I just knew that somehow that didn't fit my journey. So that issue was very important to you as, mm -hmm. as a lay person Absolutely. within the tradition. Absolutely. The fact that women were not allowed to become right. ordained clergy. Right. Yes, uh, I, I felt that. You consider that, that wasn't fair? Well, I don't even know that fairness was so much the issue. I just felt that it made a, that there was a very clear statement that women somehow were not considered to be totally equal to men. Mm -hmm. And that was the way I had been raised, was to believe that there are certainly differences between men and women, but we are equal, and so I couldn't stay in a tradition that I interpreted to mean that I so was So you alive. stayed within the Christian community, but mm -hmm. you went to another tradition. Right. yes. And, and in that <laughs> tradition, did you find female clergy? Yes, actually, I, I joined the Methodist Church, and I did find female clergy. Uh, the pastor of the church that I belonged to was male, but he frequently told me that he felt that I would end up going to seminary. Of course, at that time I kept saying, nope, I'm not going. I had no interest in it. And what were you uh, doing at that time? I, um, I had graduated from law school, and I actually was really raising my children mm -hmm. and doing a little bit of part-time law. Uh, but you had done your undergraduate work mm -hmm. at the University of Michigan. Right, right. And then I'd gone into graduate school right, and then to right, law school. Right, exactly. Yeah. This lady has <laughs> really study, hasn't she? Shelley? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Shelley, what about you? When did you start thinking that you may want to become a a clergy within your tradition? Um, it, it's been fairly recent, I would say maybe five years ago. Um, I always felt called to study and to learn. I had this desire inside of me about everything that I could, about spirituality, about Christianity, about God. And the more I studied, the more questions I had, and I remember I went to speak with a pastor, a Lutheran pastor at the time. This was when my children were, were young. And um, I, I asked him the question. He says, you know, that question is something we studied in seminary. Have you ever thought about that? Which, of course, I had not at the time <laughs> and, and wasn't in anywhere in sight for me. Um, but we moved. My husband was in the Air Force. And we moved to um, do some language studies in Monterey before we moved to Italy. And while we were in Italy, um, it, that's a spiritual place. There's, it's the <laughs> birthplace of a lot of things. And um, I, I started to, the more that I read, the more I started to think that maybe this was a place for me too, that mm -hmm. God was calling me to this also. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that both of you had um, ordained clergy who didn't put up the stop sign for you, mm -hmm. but rather in both of your cases, clergy who said, have you ever thought about doing right. seminary work? Mm -hmm. uh, 
what then happened in terms of starting the seminary career? How did you go about doing that? If you are in a tradition like Methodists that have had clergy and Lutherans and some parts of Lutherans have had clergy for maybe three decades, how did you go about then deciding how you're going to carry that out? That's, you have obvious responsibilities. You're married. You have children. Um, how did you, where did you begin? I began with my, um, my local pastor, who at the time happened to be a military chaplain, um, United Church of Christ um, was his denomination. And I spoke to him about it, and he said, well, let's, let's pray about it. Let's, let's try it out and see how it fits. Mm -hmm. And so he was very, very helpful. So you started with prayer? Yes, uh -huh. that's right. We prayed a lot. Um, I, and I tried different things in the church to see, to see what fit, and, um, and it seemed to fit. So I was encouraged. When you to talk continue. about some different things, you actually considered some things other than being clergy, being ordained? Right. I have um, a background in psychology and counseling, and I had done um, crisis counseling work for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could be called to do something in that field um, within the church. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was also a possibility that I was exploring at the time. I, I hear you being uh, waiting upon the Lord, if I may use that, getting the direction of the Spirit. Kim, uh, same way for you? Um, well, there was another step that I had to go through first, and that was that I had to find the Episcopal Church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. um, Tell and, us about and that. And I joined the Episcopal Church when we moved to Texas. Um, I joined it because I found it to be the perfect combination of the liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church and the social action of the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. um, so th there, there was just this great coming together. And it was very soon after I joined the church that I really began to realize that I felt a call to ordained ministry. And I had a wonderful rector mm -hmm. who just, who spent a long time with me in discernment. Um, and that's we, an important word yes. right there, helping you to discern yes. where yes. you would fit in Absolutely. Absolutely. in terms of your spirituality. Absolutely. I did a lot of reading and praying, and um, he started introducing some different spiritual disciplines for me. And as I walked through that, it became more apparent to me that that was really what I was being called to do. Now, you know, we've filled a, a lot of the years of your life. We've filled in this first half of the program. Now we've got you right up to that time of going to seminary. And that's an interesting story for me. And I think for our viewers of Austin Faith Dialogue, it's also interesting to hear how you develop. You're very ecumenical. You've had a, a, a variety of experiences within the Christian community. And I think that's very helpful for you as you uh, seek that discernment uh, through prayer, through discussion with other people as to the direction that God is giving to you. And I hope that you're going to stay with us for the second half of this program because we're going to continue to talk to Shelley and to Kim and to hear more about their story and what they experienced then as two women of faith on a journey towards ordination and going to seminary. Please stay with us on Austin Faith Dialogue. Austin Faith Dialogue. We're talking about women and men and some of the changes, exciting changes that are happening possibly in your faith community, but certainly throughout Christendom, that there are more and more women who are becoming 
leaders up front in the altar, the celebrants for the Blessed Sacraments, and sharing with us their story. And today we have Kim and Shelley with us who are seminarians, one at the Episcopal Seminary here in Austin and one at the Lutheran Seminary here in Austin. And we talked a little bit about your journey, the first part of the program, the journey of, of your early life and the influences and what led you to this place that you're going to say, oh, I'm going to go to seminary. When you came to seminary, now there is a process to get into seminary, and some of our viewers may not even know that process. You know, I've got to be careful not to lean too far in front of you, Kim, okay? So I'm going to make certain I don't do that. This wonderful new set, this is my first experience on this, and so uh, if, if I get in front of you, just kind of push me back. Yeah, that's right, push me back, okay? All right, good. What about that process of going to seminary? You had this Methodist pastor encourage you. You found a wonderful rector who was encouraging. In How do you decide church. in the Episcopal Church? Um, right? Well, in the Episcopal Church, there's a very long process that you go through. Uh, it, of course, starts with discernment with your rector, and then if your rector feels that, that there is a call, the rector will take you to see the bishop, mm -hmm. and the bishop will then make a decision as to whether or not you're, you should start through a process. And in that process, um, you're interviewed by several committees, and Basically, the, the idea is that the whole um, rep representatives of the whole church work with you to help you discern what your ministry will be and to discern whether you're called to lay ministry or ordained ministry. Ah, some of those options, just mm -hmm. like Shelley was saying in the first part of the program, you didn't know maybe you'd go into crisis counseling, mm -hmm. maybe you'd go into use the, your psychology background. Just where do you do ministry? Because for those watching the program, it may be that they don't realize that that the call to the ordained ministry within your traditions is a call to word and sacrament ministry. Mm -hmm. So with these people then, they kind of gave you... They walk with you through, uh -huh. through the whole process. How long is that process? Um, generally, it's about two years. Uh, as, as you were doing this, what was happening at home? What was happening with uh, <laughs> those most important people in your life, your children, your husband? Mm -hmm. What were they all saying? Well, I have three children and um, they weren't, they weren't really sure exactly what it meant uh, other than that they knew that I would go back to school, but they certainly encouraged me in it. Actually, when I first started talking about um, whether or not I should consider uh, going to seminary, I said to my husband, you know, this is something I think I, I really am, am being called to do, but uh, it, it'll be years, I know, before I can do it. I'll, I, I'll need to wait until the kids are grown and then mm. maybe I can uh, consider it. And I talked about that for about a year and, and finally my husband said, look, this is something you really feel that you're called to do. We need to get busy and figure out how to mm. make it happen. Hooray for and him. so yes. that's what we did. Yeah. And so that is really kind neat. of picked up and moved <laughs> and here we are. Yeah, and came to Austin. Yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. Shelley, how about you? Uh, what kind of process did it take for you in the Lutheran Seminary? Well, you know, it's very similar to the Episcopal process. Um, I spent time um, with the chaplain there because there was not a Lutheran pastor in Italy where we lived. Um, but I spoke to my pastor, and um, the way that it works in the Lutheran church is um, a church congregation sponsors you, and you, you go before a committee, and the committee um, determines, interviews you, and determines if, if this is something that they also agree that you're a fit for, and you apply for seminary. Mm -hmm. And um, we had always wanted to come home to Austin. Our roots are here. And it was a joy to discover that there is a Lutheran seminary here in town. And this is where our uh, family is. And and your UT graduates? Yes, yeah, so it's oh, great okay. to be home. <laughs> exactly. Longhorn fans and all that kind of stuff. Right, and when I spoke with my husband about this too, um, we, he took a look at his career and he said, well, then it, you know, maybe it's a time for a change for mine too, and this would be a good time. And so he. He was a pilot in the Air Force. In the Air Force, mm -hmm. right. And so he resigned and um, got a job flying for Southwest Airlines, mm -hmm. and he's based out of Houston now so that it all works. We're all here, mm -hmm. and um, you feel a spirit moving in that. <laughs> and you also have children. Yes, I do. I have three daughters. And initially, they were a little bit concerned. Oh, no, you're not going to be the one up front. Oh. <laughs> I said, yes, that's right. But they've come around to it, and now they said, oh, mother, you must finish. You must mm -hmm. do this. They're very uh, supportive. 
I'm very blessed to have them as my children. I hear that both of you have very supportive families, mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. that is indeed a blessing for you. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting because both Shelley and I have husbands who are commuting so that we yes. can do this. That's right. um, my husband commutes between here and Brownsville. So <laughs> it, Bless him. You know, he very much is, is committed to, to doing whatever he can. To you came to seminary. Mm -hmm. What did you find at the seminary? Were you surprised? What about the... Um, the ratio, gender ratio, what did you find a uh, female, male when you came to the seminary? My mother was concerned that I would be the only female <laughs> on campus. Um, and I think it was, it was good to discover that it's about 50-50. It, actually, at the moment, at the Episcopal Seminary, we have a few more women than men. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and isn't that interesting? Because when I was in seminary, and I'm not that old, <laughs> But there was not a female enrolled in mm. the Master Divinity program. So this is something that's changed in the years that I've been pastor. And I think it's a, I really think it's an exciting change that has come within the life of the church. Have you found while you've been at seminary any um, real struggles? Struggles with uh, obviously not being accepted because if you have those kind of numbers. How about struggles in terms of academics? Uh, any struggles in terms of... Uh, is it a challenge for you? Um, absolutely. Um, it is a very rigorous pr academic program. Um, it hasn't been um, impossible to do, but it's been, it's been tough. Um, oh, well, because you're balancing schedules. You're not only mm -hmm. students at an academic institution, right. reading, reading, and some more reading, right? Absolutely. But you also Writing have papers and yeah, other responsibilities. And, and Shelly and, and I, I think, are, are actually the unique in that we are the two that have teenage children and have husbands who are not at home all of the time. Right. So mm -hmm. in some respects, we have to take on the role of single parents and also get all of our studying done. And that's it's a juggle. Yeah. It's absolutely a juggle. And, and that's challenging. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it, it doesn't work so well. Uh -huh. um, there, there have been some rough spots. Right. Um, and I think in terms of your future, when you go into ministry also, that's one of the things that the congregational communities where you'll serve will also be uh, growing with you and kind of uh, learning how that schedule works out for you because Kim do you have internship or vicarage that, where you spend some time at the, in a parish? Actually um, we're ordained to the diaconate and it, it varies from diocese to diocese. In my diocese I'll do a two-year curacy um, so um, Part of the time that I'm a priest, I will actually, uh, or most likely, be working under a more experienced priest. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes me think. I'm thinking of your children. Tell me, tell me their names. Um, Brendan, Justin, and Bre Bethany. Brendan, mm -hmm. and Brendan is a student where? He's at Carleton College in Minnesota. In Northfield, Minnesota. Yep. And I was teasing you about that's right across town <laughs> from Saint right. Olaf. Olaf. <laughs> yeah, a Lutheran college. Right. But Northfield's a beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much in January, maybe, but it's no. pretty nice in the fall. <laughs> but, but and then you have it. Justin? Yes, I have Justin. Uh, Brendan's 19, Justin's 16, and uh, Justin goes to a school out east, so he's away during the school year. Okay, and then you have your third And then I have a 13-year-old daughter, and she's uh, at school here in Austin. Okay. Uh, so you have one child home. Right. Okay, good. Right. And Shelley? Name your three children. I, I think we need to say this on television so they can hear that. My voice. oldest daughter is Katie, and she will be a sophomore um, at the Liberal Arts Academy this year. And my middle child is Sarah, and she will be in the eighth grade at Lamar. And my youngest is Lizzie, and she will be at the new magnet program at Fulmore mm -hmm. as a sixth grader. Next and year. I've been amazed watching you uh, providing traffic, uh, not traffic, but taxi service yes. around town. and. And what you do is also you get involved with other parents who also are taking their children to different schools and receive that kind of support system. Mm -hmm. What are the issues? Let's talk about those. What are the issues that you see within the church when it comes to women being ordained? Isn't this a simple question to ask? Huh? We've got all this time to discuss mm -hmm. it, all right? But being ordained and taking a place of leadership within the church, what do you think is the biggest hurdle or issue facing the church, because some traditions within Christendom still are reticent to have women as ordained clergy. Why do you think there has been such a slow process for this to happen, Kim? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would have oh, to right? ask well, <laughs> yeah. I, 
I, you know, there are a multitude of reasons. Um, and in many cases, it depends on what tradition you come out of. There are traditions who believe that, that there is biblical warrant for not having women ordained. Mm. Um, I don't happen to feel that that's supported, mm. um, if you look carefully at the scriptures. Uh, some of it's just social, but I think it's changing. Uh, one of the things that has changed, certainly in the Episcopal Church, is just that as we have more and more female clergy, people become more comfortable with it. Mm. it. It was something that was new 25 years ago, but now you don't get as many raised eyebrows, um, generally speaking. Although here so, in the South, there's but, still well, some Well, I, I was to getting that. ready to say it's a right. little different in, in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm a Northerner, and I have to say that the, something that I have noticed, and this is strictly anecdotal, um, is that generally speaking, the role of women in the South is not the same as the role of women in, in the North. Um, things tend to still be a little bit more traditional. And I think because of that, it's slightly more difficult for women in clergy uh, here. Shelley, how about you? You agree with Kim on that? Or? Absolutely. Uh, change is hard. It's hard for people to adjust to that. But uh, it's been almost a generation, and hopefully uh, the next generation won't struggle with it um, as much as our generation has. Are you afraid of the struggle? Do you have any fears about this struggle? Because you will have, you are, well, you're dealing with your struggles very well from what I can tell, but what about as you look forward to um, parish life? Well, one of the inconsistencies is that while there are um, more than half women at seminaries, um, they still aren't hired at those mm -hmm. um, Within the, the denominations, within the parishes, um, people are still reluctant to hire women. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. That's a struggle that's out there still. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to fix that problem. We have supportive bishops who, who are very much um, helpful and, and take a strong role in um, advancing the cause of, of women as leaders. And that's helpful also, yes. whether it be the rector or the pastors or the bishops and those mm -hmm. people who are a part of your life or the seminary faculty right. and the communities, they can be supportive to you. You know, you are, um, you are indeed a blessing to your families but you're also much of a blessing to the community of faith and you are there um, leading the struggle and you're fascinating, you're educated, you're articulate and we are fortunate to know you and have you in our traditions and I hope that you're going to come back to Austin Faith Dialogue because I think we really didn't get into some of the issues and there will be some more issues and I'll get all kinds of letters saying you didn't ask this so we're going to do that. We want you to know that the church is changing and the church is alive and we invite you to share in those changes and support those who lead you. God bless you.